Hey everybody, what is up? Chad Wesley Smith here, bringing you another, maybe the second installment of the Jug Life podcast. I am joined by Anthony Pomponio, the Italian, the Italian stallion, Antonio Pomponio, <laughs> the most jacked weightlifter in America for sure, maybe in the entire world. <laughs> Today's Jug Life podcast is powered by Left Coast Brewing's Trestles IPA, right here in Orange County, California. So make sure you guys go check that out. Pompey, how you doing, buddy? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. So Pomp's just out here uh, for Christmas, visiting family in, in Palm Springs, but he's normally a resident at the Olympic Training Center. So I think the first thing we want to get out there for, for people is you have a very unique background for a weightlifter, being that you're a, you're a bodybuilder. So kind of tell us how you, how you got into bodybuilding. Yeah, so I mean, it's not the ideal background to come into the sport with, but I was, this is what I was stuck with. So um, I grew up my whole life, you know, playing every sport like every kid does, baseball up until I was 13 years old, almost every single day, just got really burnt out of that. Uh, basketball and football, I continued through high school, ran track in high school. So my senior year, I ended up just doing, uh, uh, let's see, I did football, I didn't play basketball, and I ran track. Um, I ended up winning the, De I was in the CIF, um, excuse me, Desert Valley League, and I won that uh, track and field in the 100 meter, and I went on to CIF, but I had the flu, but my time wouldn't have been too competitive with the top guys anyway. I did a 10, 8, 0, 100 meter. So I had the fast switch muscle going. Um, and then I wanted to continue playing football, but unfortunately my junior and senior, the football didn't go as I wanted it to. I ended up getting hurt. and. Um, actually contusions in my left quad and then my right quad my senior year. So I only played like nine total games in two years. It really sucked. But I knew I wanted to continue to play and I went to uh, Nike football camps. Um, shoot me and Chai might have been there together at one point. Uh, at San Diego State when I did. Uh, I went as a defensive back. Um, it was funny because I weighed like, I don't know, 140, 550 pounds. <laughs> so it was tiny. And uh, I benched 185 20 times and that led like all the... Um, skill players besides one one big running back who ended up going to Nebraska and uh, so I ended up going to a smaller school down in LA Whittier College um, so I played there for all four years started all conference all that good stuff and uh, I knew I wanted to continue playing football but coming from a small school you know basically good luck trying to go to the NFL and being my height and my color being a white being, being a white running being back. a white running back doesn't really help so is Danny Woodhead your hero uh, yeah I like Woodhead a lot he's great man <laughs> So, um, and I'm a Charger fan too, which helps, but... It's going to be the Los Angeles Chargers. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Probably, though. So, um, I got into bodybuilding uh, after my senior year of football, but still knowing I wanted to play football. Uh, I was... Uh, my quarterback, the year before my senior year, went to Europe and played in the league in uh, Sweden. And he was like, dude, you should totally come out here and play. Here's the website you go on. Post your videos on there. So I went on and I did that and I was getting a lot of uh, contact through that website. Um, but unfortunately they wanted me to come there in March of 2009 and I was graduating in June and unlike NFL, you're not gonna sign multi-million dollar <laughs> contracts. So it's just basically playing the game and you're still paid as a professional athlete but not making multi-million dollars. So I ended up graduating uh, in June, or excuse me, May 2009 and uh, I, was, I just started bodybuilding. My first bodybuilding show was that March. And uh, I excelled, I did pretty well. Um, went on and did another show in June and won my weight class, won overall uh, for um, junior. That was Junior Miss California. So that was a really cool accomplishment. But something was missing in the bodybuilding community. Like I didn't love it like I loved football or loved the com competition of sports because bodybuilding is more aesthetic based. So it's not like you go out there and perform, you know? It's all preparation to that point. So, um, I ended up doing bodybuilding throughout all of 2009. I would go to Venice Beach often and do photo shoots with large, you know, magazines. What magazines were you in? Uh, let's see here. Shoot, Iron Man a couple of times, a couple of good spreads, uh, Muscle Fitness, and then Muscle Mag. So for being in the sport, for and Muscle Development too, right? Uh, I did a lot of photo shoots with them, but I was never in their magazine because I wasn't big enough. <laughs> so um, another thing with bodybuilding is. Uh, these guys are just huge, man, like 300 pounds, you know, 260 pounds, and I was 176 pounds, you know? So, and I wasn't willing to take that next step and get on the right supplements, let's say, 
So, so really Soviet pack on that weight. Supplement. Yeah, the Soviet sports supplements to pack on that <laughs> weight. So I was kind of in a bind at that point. Um, so I was always known as like the really like athletic and strong bodybuilder, but um, you know, in the short time I was in, everyone, my name was growing, but they're like, you gotta, you know, make a choice here. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go play football. <laughs> So March 2010 came around and I took off to Europe for five months. I played football in uh, Switzerland and uh, I did really well there. It was my best season. I was offensive MVP of the league, uh, threw out a bunch of great stats and stuff. And Was the league you were playing in, was it all based in Switzerland or were you going yeah, to well, other countries? Yeah, well, it was all based in Switzerland except we played uh, a team that was in Austria because they were in our league too, just because the map wise it was mm. just easier for them to be in our league. And then um, the way, it works in Europe is they'll there is called the European Bowl and it's based on your previous year's records so that following year we so we became a second in the league we lost in championship game so now they were granted a spot in the Euro Bowl like series so like every like third game you would play in a tournament bracket like Switzerland would play a team from Italy or from oh. Germany and then they just kind of wind down from there so I unfortunately I wasn't able to do that because I didn't end up going back but I kind of led the team into that position. Did you get to did you get to travel around Europe? Quite yeah, a bit? yeah, kind of. Like we had bye weeks. It was really cool because you know traditionally we in college you play nine to twelve games. You have one bye week. Whereas in Europe uh, we had one game, two bye weeks, a game, one bye week. Like it was our we only played three games in a row. Was the most we played in a row. So every game I felt fresh. You know I felt ready to go, which was real cool. So during those bye weeks, we would go around and travel. We'd go to Germany a little bit, because where I was was on the border of Germany and France. And then uh, our big trip was we went down to the coast of Italy, and that was a lot of fun. So um, Europe's a really cool place. I'd recommend that for anyone who wants to play football, but the, you know doesn't have the height or weight to go to NFL. Do you have any like, 45-year-old dudes on your team? Uh, yeah, actually I did, like <laughs> for sure. Two guys were old and were like, why are you still playing, man? They just, just love it. Just you know? living the dream. They just love it. Just so living the dream. Yep. So, uh, so yeah, I came back from the U.S. I mean, came back to the U.S. Um, August 30th. I remember like it was yesterday. My girlfriend Charlotte picked me up from the airport, and uh, I was gonna do some Canadian football combines that I had lined up over here in Orange County, actually. And uh, um, I was actually training, but at the time, um, I was sponsored by Muscle Tech through bodybuilding. It's kind of crazy period. I was almost doing three sports at once. And uh, I had to compete in bodybuilding still. So the first month back, I was just doing some bodybuilding training, kind of getting back in the swing of things. And uh, this was September, came around, and my older brother, who was a fitness director at the gym I was at, said, hey, dude, I want you to meet this guy. He does Olympic lifting. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, we'll see what's up. So I met my coach, uh, Nick Frasca, and ever since then, I just started just only Olympic weightlifting. And then, um, let's see, now that brings us to October 2010. And from October and November, all I did was Olympic weightlifting. I didn't touch a dumbbell, nothing. No um, hypertrophy work, no isolation exercises, nothing. Uh, and I competed in my bodybuilding shows. I had to compete that year in order to keep my sponsorship with them. And I actually won. It was the best show I've done yet. And I looked the best. My legs were more full. My back was 10 times bigger just in those two months period. So, uh, no. what, do you th what do you think the big difference was, you know, training wise, how, why that made you have a better physique than actual bodybuilding training? Um, it's just basically just doing this, just a lot of barbell work. I hadn't done that much barbell work, even in football, you know, our training wasn't consistent enough throughout the course of the year. Whereas, um, with weightlifting, we were doing only barbell work and I feel like everyone should have barbell work in their program, whether they're seven years old or just starting out weightlifting because it just builds that mature muscle that you need to become you know more full and more fit so yeah that was basically it Tell us about your first, your first weightlifting. Oh man! So, this was actually in January 2011. Now, uh, I think like second weekend, 
Um, I saw pictures of it. I posted one the other day. It's hilarious. <laughs> so basically, at that point, I knew I loved weightlifting, but I was like, man, I could still maybe play football, you know? So um, I was still contacted by Europe teams. So I'm like, I don't know if I want to go back there. Like, I had a great experience out there. Everything was cool, but it's almost like you got to put your life on hold here just to go there for five months, you know? So I was like, we'll see. And uh, so January came around, and my coach was like, hey, let's compete in this weightlifting. I'm like, cool, let's do it. So that same weekend, I had a Canadian football comment that had been in communication with this guy, uh, the scout for this region. And uh, basically, I had to choose between the two, and then I chose the weightlifting route right away. So football was basically out of the question at that point. So from that point on, I kind of knew I was going to go down the weightlifting road. But um, the first meet was crazy, man. It was so much fun. And there was, was in a CrossFit gym. I think it was probably one of the first weightlifting meets in the actual CrossFit gym because now they're all the time. Almost every yeah. weekend, there's a CrossFit gym weightlifting meet. So it was at CrossFit Monrovia, I believe. They still have a lot of weightlifting meets there. Yeah. Well, that was at, that's Team Academy that they're heavily oh, okay. that. So this was actually, I don't know what how they're affiliated with weightlifting at all, but there, there was a meet there. So we're like, let's do it. So um, let's see here. Going in, my best snatch was 120 in training. And uh, I ended up making 110 almost killing the judge with my first 120. <laughs> you can look on my YouTube, I like run off the platform. It's the funniest thing ever. I still laugh at it today. And then I made 120. So knowing I needed uh, 253 to qualify for nationals that year, that's crazy, 253 for nationals. Now it's like 281, I think, or two, almost 290 for 85s. They still need to raise it up. I mean, there yeah. was like 100 and some 85s at nationals. Yeah, it was crazy. Like 75 at nationals mm -hmm. and 120 at AO. That's crazy. Um, so, uh, so I need a 135 opener. So at the time I only power cleaned. I didn't know how to do a full clean yet. Um, so I power cleaned 135, made the jerk. Boom. Cool. Uh, so I qualified for nationals at that point. I kind of hit my goal. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, let's go 150. So 15 kilo jump. Yeah, I had power clean 150 like two weeks before that. So I was like, I can make it. It was like illy illy and 15 kilo jump. Yeah, it was, cra <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, nothing. So I made the... Actually, so happened. I, out of nowhere, just decided to full clean it. First time in my life I had ever like done a full clean above 300 pounds, and my elbows touched, and I came up. I had no idea about the rule yet, so I'm getting ready to jerk, and they just kept saying, "Down, down." I'm like, I dropped it. I'm like, what? What's wrong? You know, I have no idea what the rule is. He's like, you can't touch your elbows. I was like, oh shit, you know. So I go to the back and follow myself because there was like 10 people at the meet, you know. So, mm -hmm. And uh, I go back out and I power clean it the next time. And then I missed the jerk. So I ended up at 255 in my first Olympic weightlifting meet. Um, qualified for nationals. Uh, and then it was funny because the next week was the LA Fit Expo. And I think it was the first year that they put on the American Record Breakers there, which no longer exists, unfortunately. But it was the first year they put that on. And uh, I was the newbie on, you know, on that competition stage. The new kid on the weightlifting block. So if we were to fast forward... What, about four years from there, or three and a half years from there? Yeah, I know you train by yourself while you run in the yard out there in, in Palm Desert, but let's, let's talk about the transition to the Olympic Training Center. Oh, cool, yeah. So, um, let's see here. When did I realize I wanted to go out? Uh, I'm trying to just think of the date. It was October 2013. I went out there, September, October. I went out there for two weeks, and... Uh, I was like, you know what, if I want to get serious with this, which I do, because at the time I was training full-time, I mean not full-time, I was training four or five days a week, um, but not full-time weightlifting training like we do now. So when I mean by full-time, like nine times a week, your life is weightlifting. Okay, so I trained five times a week, but my life wasn't weightlifting, if that yeah. makes sense. You know, I didn't wake up and go to therapy, um, then go to practice, and then sleep for three hours, and then go to another practice, and then go to therapy. You know, that wasn't my life. My life was... Wake up, train some people, um, go home, eat, train some more people, practice, then uh, you know, train some more people, go to bed. So I was working at the same time. So, um, I so I knew I wanted to make that move, but I just didn't know when it would happen. You know, but I knew if I wanted to become the best weightlifter I could possibly be, I needed to commit 110 percent into it. You know, so, yeah, so let's go go a little more in depth on like kind of what your daily or weekly schedule is like living in Colorado Springs at the training center. Okay, so basically, um, 
I'm off campus. I'm, I'm, I live off campus because I feel like I'm just too old to live on campus. <laughs> I don't feel like having rules. Um, they wouldn't accept this right here. So, um, yeah, just little things. And um, actually, initially, I went out there and I was just facility use. I said, you know what? I just have to get out here. Like, I know once I'm out there, give me a couple months and, and I'll do well. So, and then I started earning more stuff and now I'm off campus resident. So, um, as I started winning. So, basically, wake up uh, Monday through Saturday, we have what's called morning warming. Uh, for the people that live on campus, it's mandatory to go. Zygma gets mad if you don't go. But if you live off, uh, he doesn't really care if you come. I mean, you should be going, but if you don't go, he's not going to get on you as much. But I would say I go 70% of the time. Sometimes I feel like my body just needs more sleep, you know what I mean? Sometimes you just need sleep. So we have this morning warming for about a half an hour. So it starts at 8 a.m. If you guys want to see an example, we have a full video of morning warming on uh, on our YouTube. Just search morning warming juggernaut train <laughs> systems and you'll see these guys doing all their stretches and the little coach segment up there like a little badass aerobics instructor <laughs> leading you guys it's really cool check it out i mean that's that's what we do every day and zygmunt has been doing it since 1970s so obviously something good has <laughs> happened from it you know so that's morning warming and then after that we go eat um usually as a as a whole as a team there's like 10 of us in there it's really funny and uh then uh, it depends because we have practice at 10.30, so depending on what your schedule looks like, so usually I'll go to the recovery center and get in the uh, Norma Tech boots, or I'll go and get therapy at that time depending on what I need done. Um, and then practice at 10.30, um, that's Monday through Saturday. Um, and then uh, this is Monday, Wednesday, Friday now. We'll uh, have a three hour break, so after practice, usually 30 ish uh, go eat lunch. And then um, after that, it's just like downtime. Like we have two more hours till our next practice starts at four. And I usually go home and just get off your feet and nap, like just total nap mode. So I do that and then um, practice at four till probably about six, 6.30ish. And then usually 6.30 by the time we get out. And then the recovery center closes at seven. So you have to like rush over there. And I usually contrast at that point or sauna or steam room. Uh, something to that effect. So just get some recovery in and then go home. I, so I eat dinner at home always. Go home, eat dinner, and then repeat, sleep, repeat. Yeah, so you guys are training nine sessions a week. So doubles, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, singles, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Yeah. How tough of a transition was that for you from training four or five times a week to training nine times a week? Oh, it's crazy, man. Like, um, don't jump into it right away. That's my number one recommendation. You just can't go from four to, to nine. Okay? You got to kind of ease into it. And Zygmunt's usually pretty good at that. Although sometimes he's, you know, pushes us pretty good. But uh, it's it's hard transition. I mean, it's just you're doubling your workload in in sense, you know. So I would just uh, recommend easing into that amount of volume throughout the week. The uh, what's what's the biggest challenge for you living living at the training center? I uh, just. Staying healthy, just maintaining every single day, staying on top of things. That's the most important thing as a weightlifter or as any athlete that I've learned over the years is if you have a little bit of a sore uh, wrist, for example, take the steps to make sure you are you get it right or correct the movement or whatever you need to do in order to get that wrist ready to go for the next practice. Because no matter what, we're athletes, okay? We're going to be sore. You're going to be tired. That that's, that's just part of the game that we're in, you know, but... The, the, the uh, guy who stays injury free or at least in injury is going to win. Like, yeah, honestly. That's something really important for people to understand. Like, if you can go, you know, for weightlifting uh, an Olympic sport, you know, they're really training in uh, a quadrennial, four year periods. You know, if you could have four years of good training, not great training, just, mm -hmm. you know, better than average to good training. But for consistent injury for years of it compared to someone who has nine months of great training, three months of being injured, six months of you know, great training, a month of injured, you know, back and forth like that where it's where there's up and down, up and down. I think those people who can just be nice and steady, they're always gonna be more successful. Yeah. That was a big thing for me, especially yeah, you know, I try and do it as much as I can in powerlifting when I was still throwing the shot put. When I was a senior in college and my year of throwing as a post collegiate you know, I felt like I was much more professional about my training because I go and do all those little things. You know, even when yes. you're not, when you're not injured, doing the preventative, 
stuff, getting physical therapy or do ice bath, contrast shower, whatever it is, doing it before you need it, you know, so you don't, so you you stay healthy, you don't have to get healthy. I think that's a, that's, a huge thing. That's the most important thing I've learned over, from my high school days till now, and this is a 10 year span, you know, if when I was in high school, I could have avoided getting those contusions in my legs. I mean, my, my life would have been much different, I'm sure, you know? So just the, I would have probably done some ART or gotten deep tissue massage or something to prevent that from happening, you know? So preventative care is huge. Every day I'm in there and multiple athletes take advantage of, you know, we're, we're lucky because we have it, you know, the palms of our hands, but there's stuff that you guys could do at home that is preventative, just stretching, you know? Uh, ice bath. I mean, I used to ice bath at my house all the time. I'm sure you do too. Like, I don't think I, I don't fit in my bathtub. Oh yeah, shit, that's right. <laughs> well, you could fit in a pool. <laughs> you got the ocean right here though, so um, just those little things uh, to stay healthy. It's huge before you start feeling it. Just the littlest pain. Like my knee's a little bit swollen right now, and I'm that's why I didn't squat today because I'm like, hmm, maybe I'll just take a little bit more of a break, and then tomorrow I'll squat. You know, just the little things that's gonna make a difference in the end. Welcome to Strong360, Juggernaut's one-of-a-kind online community designed to help you improve as an athlete and coach. Strong360 is a network of coaches, athletes, and trainers, all looking to share information and knowledge and help each other get better every day. Strong360 is filled with valuable resources to better educate you as you pursue your goals. Some of the great features of Strong360 include troll-free forms, programming for a variety of sports and goals, over 50 hours and growing of exclusive videos from juggernaut coaches and athletes, in-depth articles on programming, rehab, nutrition, movement, mindset, and more, exclusive chats and Q&As with Team JTS. Strong360 is a library of knowledge for powerlifting, weightlifting, CrossFit, nutrition, strongman, rehab, and more, and gives you direct access to JTS experts like Colin Burns, Jacob Sipskin, Dr. Quinn Hennock, Nick Shaw, and myself, Chad Wesley Smith. For less than $10 a month, you can become part of Strong360, the community of strength, and start improving now. Obviously, you know, the sport of weightlifting has been growing tremendously. Let's say USAW membership has quadrupled yeah. in the last two or three years. Um, so a lot of exciting things happening with weightlifting, also a lot of kind of turmoil within uh, USAW and you know, the CEO just resigned the other week, Michael Masick, and if you guys follow along, our friends with weightlifters on Facebook and follow all social media drama, you know, there's a lot of upheaval about the world team selection and I've written you know, articles about what I think USA weightlifting should do, but if we were to make Pompey, if, if, if Pompey was USAW president, what would be the things that you want to do for weightlifting? Oh man, um, we'll continue to grow, build relationships with the organizations that have helped us grow, such as CrossFit. Um, I feel like we don't have a strong enough relationship with them. Um, and they're the reason why we've grown so much in a lot of our eyes, you know, I mean, athletes actually can do weightlifting full time because we're teaching seminars and making enough income to support ourselves for a couple months at a time. You know, so that's huge. Uh, just building, continue to build better relationships. Uh, as weightlifting, I feel like we need a title sponsor. You know, so a big company out there that's going to stand behind us and you know help us uh, get to the main public more. So you know, CrossFit has Reebok. Uh, we need Nike <laughs> uh, as a title sponsor. Um, you know. The competitions need to be the Visa American Open, the Nike American Open, you know, that's just little things that we could work on. And now weightlifting has grown big enough. I mean, everywhere I go, I see people wearing weightlifting clothes and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. You know, when I, even when I started five years ago, that it wasn't like that. You know, you ask guys that are 10, 15 years ago that are still in sport, like, dude, we have no support back then. Now it's growing so much that we actually can be athletes, you know, and not have to work full time. So just build relationships, uh, continue to grow that that uh, the networking base 
And uh, yeah, I mean, just uh, continue to support athletes because in the end, the athlete's the one that is building the brand of USA Weightlifting. So it's really difficult uh, for athletes to train full time if they don't have the support from our federation, you know. And Zygmunt really believes in that a lot too, just support, support, support. Um, getting, you know, maybe more of a, I think Chad had written about it in his article, more of a regional slash satellite program, uh, developing coaches, that kind of thing, you know. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the making. There's, and the cool thing is with weightlifting right now, it's growing so fast that I, I think we might be experiencing some growing pains. But um, we have good guys in the back office like Phil who are doing their best they can to throw events with 900 competitors when the previous yeah. biggest one was 400 people. You know I mean? It's just such fast growth that um, I hope it continues to grow. But at a certain point, everything kind of evens off, you know. Um, so it's just, just a matter of uh, building networks, making sure we start kids younger, okay? Because nowadays... Um, when I was a kid, we all wanted to be football players, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you grew up wanting to be a football player. Nowadays, we have, kids have the opportunity to walk into a CrossFit gym and say, oh, I want to be a CrossFit athlete. I want to be a weightlifting athlete. Because it's at the palm of our hands now. So we never had that when we were growing up. That's why I started when I was 23, 24 years old, you know. Um, and now kids can start when they're 8, 9 years old. So that I think over the course of the years, we're going to be, definitely become more competitive as a nation um, internationally. But there's other stuff right now that's preventing us from it that um, we won't cover today. <laughs> <laughs> so for people watching who, who don't know, uh, Pump is the, has won the last three national competitions in the 85 kilo class. So the 2014 American Open, 2015 uh, USAW Nationals, and then just a couple weeks ago, the 2015 American Open. So, I mean, king, king of the 85 kilo class <laughs> right now in the US. But, uh, so what's, what's coming up next? Obviously 2016, is an Olympic year. It's kind of a little bit of a complicated process of, of how that stuff works. So currently the U.S. men have zero Olympic spots, but we can go get one. So what would need to happen for you to get that one potential spot? Okay, so there's a couple things that need to happen. Um, I hate to say this, but we need those <laughs> those drug reports from, <laughs> from World Championships to keep keep testing positive for uh, substances. Um, and then we could potentially gain three spots, but I mean, that's... that's yeah, short, short of those yeah. two or three countries, you know, getting knocked out by, by positives. I'm yeah. talking like the Pan Am route. Oh, the Pan okay. So, um, I mean, my good buddy Alex is at number one right now, and I, I just looked at it on my phone. I think I probably need like a 350 plus, 355, somewhere around there. So the thing is that those top five guys, five kilos can make a huge difference for all of us, you know, top five, top six guys. So it's just a matter of making lifts. You know, I have to perform in the competitions. I can't go two for six, three for six, you know, especially in the clean and jerk. So um, there's a few things that, that I need to personally change around in my training that uh, me and Zygmunt already had discussed that I feel, because no matter what, if you believe in something, it's going to more than likely work for you, you know, especially when it comes to weightlifting. Um, if you believe it, it's going to more than likely work because you're going to just believe in it, you know. Um, so I just need to continue to get stronger, continue to get my legs stronger, legs stronger, legs stronger, pull stronger. Um, once you have the movements down, you know, it's just a matter of just knowing what you personally need to do in order to put on the most weight on the bar. But just consistency as well. So you guys have nationals in May, right? Yeah. And then the top eight? How many guys are making Pan Ams? Yeah, there? top eight. So there's actually, so the Pan Am qualifier works like this. So uh, Worlds and American Open counted for the first qualifier. So there's a list that's out now. And I sit six on that list and they take eight, or I'd probably take 10, but two alternates. Um, and then uh, just released a couple weeks ago, there's going to be another qualifier in Philadelphia uh, during Junior Nationals. Okay. So that's the second qualifier. And that's the third weekend of February. And then National Championships. And then... Pan Ams. So there's still two more opportunities for people to bump their placement up. Yeah. Um, which is, I think it's good. I mean, I don't mind it, but some people, there's controversy, of course, you know? Always. Yeah. So what, how it works is what needs to happen is through those four meets, Worlds, AO, the Junior Qualifier, and Nationals, the top eight ranked men's lifters, and the way that they do the rankings is like based on your percentage of the world total. Yeah. 
Yeah. So. Yeah. So yeah, they they take the average of the last five years of worlds and Olympics and say, all right, this is, yeah, you know, th this is the total in eighty five kilo class that's going to score points, and say, all right, Pompey is eighty seven percent of that total, and then we have another guy in the sixty nine kilo class, and he's ninety percent of that total. So however they rank on that on that list, that's how we get the top eight lifters, because you know you got to consider how competitive they are in their weight class internationally, not just how good they are in the U S. So it's a, it's a fairly complicated. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, it's really complicated. I yeah. mean, there's pamphlets you can read about it, yeah. but 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 after nationals in May in Salt Lake City, we're going to take the top eight people on that list, and they're going to go to Pan Ams. Where are Pan Ams this year? Uh, Columbia. Columbia. So those top eight guys are going to go to Pan Ams and compete for the U.S. at Pan Ams in June, and then as long as the U.S. I think it's top seven. Isn't yeah, it? something like that. Ranks as a top seven team, then we'll get one mm -hmm. at large Olympic spot. And his top scorer at Pan Am's is the one who's getting the spot, right? But yeah. So. It could be anyone, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, it's because it depends who shows up yeah. to the meet, then seven, who lifts well. and Seven months is, well, yeah, seven months of training is a long time to yeah. put on some kilos. So if you're a fan of USA weightlifting, this is, I mean, men's and women's side, this is going to be a very, very exciting, very competitive time between that junior nationals qualifier, nationals, and then Pan Ams, where the women, you know, we have some great women's lifters who are jockeying for these three spots, really two spots. I think Sarah's locked in now. Uh, Jenny, I think. Jenny's locked in? Yeah. I'm not 100% sure. It's not released yet. I thought it was Sarah because Jenny had one score from 69 and one from 75s. I don't know. Okay. I hope they don't do that. I think that's what they're doing. Shit. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> one of the women's lifters, either Sarah Robles or Jenny Arthur, is locked on the team right now. And then there's, you know, probably six or seven girls yeah, legitimately fighting for that those last two Olympic spot. spots. And then for the guys, like we said, it's <laughs> they gotta lift great really three times in the next six months. They need to lift great at at the juniors. They need to lift great at nationals. Then they need to lift great and be the best U.S. lifter at Pan Ams. And that one person is gonna get that Olympic spot. It's pretty crazy, man. And there's a lot of us, too, that are battling. I mean, yeah. one may going two for six instead of three for six could be the difference in you on the team or off the team in order just to have that opportunity to try to make that Olympic team. So it's going to be it's gonna be crazy next couple of months. Definitely follow it if you enjoy weightlifting or just craziness of any sport, honestly. All right. Well, uh, Pomp, where can, where can people find you on the Internet? Uh, there's a couple of places. Um, through Juggernaut for one, um, this man right here. Uh, Instagram AR Pomponio, that's my what do you call it handle? That sure. Handle? That's my handle. Um, and then AnthonyPomponio.net uh, personal website, and then Facebook as well. Uh, Anthony Rocco Pomponio for athlete page. That's like the most Italian name ever. Can you switch it to Antonio? Rocco? Antonio Rocco, yeah maybe. An Anthony. Pretty soon Rocco Pomponio. Yeah. Antonio, Pomponio. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, so make sure that's A R P O M P O N I O on Instagram. He's always lifting weights, flexing. Flexing. Nah, I don't do much flexing anymore. Maybe maybe you need to pick up flexing. Let's see if the followers pick up, the flexing will pick up. I think if the flexing picks up, <laughs> the followers will pick up. It might be those G for P guys coming back from the <laughs> bodybuilding days. But, you know, likes are likes. Likes. likes are likes. Likes are likes. So, yeah, make sure to go follow Pompey on there. Uh, you know, please, just, I'm trying to stay consistent and get back on the on the podcasting game. So, go on iTunes, give the Jug Life podcast five star review. Follow us on YouTube. Find me at Chad Wesley Smith on Instagram, Chad Wesley Smith fan page on Facebook, at Juggernaut Training on Instagram. All over the place. All over. All over. Orange County. Facility. Come. Wild Goose Tavern. Wild Goose Tavern. Come say hi. <laughs> All right, guys. Pompey, thank you very much. Thank sir. you, man. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thanks for watching.